Let me let me say a, a couple of things just to emphasize what I think is important here. And then we can come back and talk about the nuts and bolts of Section 230. Senator Wyden was very generous to me and to Danny and to the stakeholders. But one of the big takeaways from the battle over 230 was that it was a real coalition effort. It was conservatives, liberals, civil libertarians, Prodigy, AOL, Microsoft. I, I could go copy service. Some of them don't even exist anymore. But it was the computer industry standing together and saying we have to – boy, we have a big education job to do. If we're going to get the policy right, including protecting kids as well as free speech, we can't let Congress have this view that this is a new – that this isn't a new medium that spans the globe. So we needed to – it was the first effort to educate the Congress about the new medium. And what the, the end of the story is that in conference, Section 230 passed overwhelmingly in the House, 414 to 4. It didn't pass Exxon. It passed this different vision, decentralized, user-controlled vision. In conference, Exxon prevailed. The conservative, social conservatives and people concerned about pornography and not the Internet want to work very hard, and, and we were overwhelmed in the, in the conference. So what was – we tried to substitute a narrower standard called harmful to minors for indecency. That failed. We did move enforcement to the Justice Department, but the most important thing is that Section 230 stayed in. When you read the bill as passed by – in February, the Telecommunications Act in February of 1996 – it makes no sense because 230 was designed as a substitute for Exxon. So it says nothing in this section has anything to do with Section 223, which then was Exxon. So that required the whole coalition to get together and challenge the statute. As everyone knows, the ACLU went into court in ACLU v. Reno and said this, con this statute is unconstitutional, the indecency provision – because it's overbroad and vague. We file a second lawsuit right behind them called ALA v. Reno, made up of CDT and AOL and Prodigy and CompuServe, a very different challenge. We went in to make the argument that's embodied in Section 230 that the least restrictive way and the most effective way in a global medium to protect kids is to focus on user empowerment. And those tools, and to demonstrate those tools, we wired the court in Philadelphia. We made a very serious case with Jenner and Block as our attorneys uh, and took a lot of the study that we had done together and made that part of our challenge. And when the Supreme Court came down, you will see that they do say it, the indecency standard is very vague, but the least restrictive means test, which some civil libertarians didn't like, because it encouraged good Samaritans and private filtering, which to some was the burning of cyberspace, that was the hook on which the court decided the case. And in so June 26, 1997, when the court struck it down, Exxon was gone, and Section 230 was there. And in my view, what had started out as the Communications Decency Act became the Communications Democracy Act. And it's on that foundation that we've gone forward, and I'd really – at this point, uh, you know, credit everyone who's here because you all worked on it in some way. And it was an important point, and it says we've got to educate and we've got to do that together. And I'd like to turn to Todd, who can talk about some of the operation of 230 over time um, and how it's impacted liability and intermediaries. And then Danny, who was there and is now our Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the White House, can perhaps – take us through the global situation and how 230 plays part in the, the need to develop a technology architecture or policy architecture that promotes freedom globally. Todd?
I always find 230 very interesting and very helpful for our company and for the um, eventual development of the Internet because of what it really says, right? I mean, the title itself is not about the Communications Democracy Act. The, the title is Protection for Private Blocking and Screening of Offensive Materials. And the provision really has turned out to be for many companies and for many others the Good Samaritan provision that was so important for what we think is really the development of a lot of responsibility and people taking steps to make the Internet not necessarily um, restricted, but much more able to grow in a healthy way. So, for example, prior to the case law that was coming down, Stratton, Oakmont, AOL, and the Prodigy cases were much more along the lines of because AOL would take actions and had actions in which they had restricted others from using their services, they were assuming liability. They were assuming duties of care, and therefore the better action for an interactive service provider to do at the time was to stick their head in the sand. And that sticking the head in the sand is where there was a significant concern, and if you go through the rest of 230, the provisions are really about how do you allow a company or an interactive computer service to go back and to actively get involved and try to stop bad things from happening. And that, therefore, this was a responsibility obligation that was being allowed rather than the reverse. And what we've seen since the development of that, we think that that Good Samaritan side of the equation has been remarkably helpful to allow companies and for other people to participate in which they are able to also eliminate portions of, of materials that they find offensive. And for our company, at least, it has given us the ability over time to really work with law enforcement, work with others to say these are where we want to draw the line, for, for example, offensive material, hate material, whether we can take down hate material or not as a private company, Section 230 in many ways gives us the right to do that. And that's not necessarily what's been thought of as we celebrate the 15 years of the CDA and the 15 years of Section 230. The other side of this that doesn't get discussed a lot and where I think there's been a significant pushback in courts and will continue to be a pushback is the liability exemption. And any liability exemption in which you say this group of people has no responsibility for materials that came across their services or their sites, they're not responsible for it. And what you have is in many instances aggrieved parties that have no remedies. They are, cannot find the original publisher of the material or the publisher of the material is, is unapproachable. It's already been out there, for example, in a, in a defamation situation where the harm has already occurred. And there's no way in which they can recover. And what we've done is we've allowed an interactive service provider to be able to be in a position where they could not assume liability for those, for those, those materials. That has meant that you will continuously be challenged in courts from very challenging situations in which people who have what appears on the face to be very good, colorable claims, and they won't be made whole. And therefore, you will continuously see, and we see this globally, a desire for courts to constantly limit and push back on what the liability exemptions mean. And so therefore, it's very important that we do recognize that you are going to have case law that will continue in which there will be many judges and courts that really try to limit and cabin the liability exemption that is found within 230. And 230 does stand out there as a way in which internationally we can say this is a model that works for a lot of other places and a lot of other people and does work. And finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the international piece and then turn it over to Danny, who really understands it far more than I do. But the international piece of 230 has allowed us to go to places like India, to places like Australia, to places like China and South Korea and stand and say, this makes sense for the growth and the development of the Internet. And in most instances, we get significant support from policymakers who do understand that for their societies, for their countries, their economic growth is in many ways dependent upon what type of an Internet they create. And 230 is a pretty good start that has been in many ways um, emulated and copied around the world. So I want to turn it over to Danny for a little more on that issue. Thank you.
Thanks, uh, Todd, and thanks, Jerry, and thanks, Tim, for organizing. Um, it, it's it's a kind of extraordinary honor to, to be here, to have the chance to look back and, and hear people's uh, reflections. Um, I, I, I do want to say that there are, uh, there are a couple of people actually who are missing, who, um, uh, unless they walked in, uh, <laughs> but I don't think so. Um, uh, you know, so many of you who, who are here uh, uh, were, were involved and critical back then. There are a couple of people who were really a key part of the coalition that Jerry mentioned, uh, uh, Jill Lesser and Bill Burrington uh, from, from AOL. Really, um, uh, Jill was first at People 4 with Leslie and, 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 and then at AOL. With Bill, um, uh, uh, in a certain way, uh, Gene Kimmelman and Mark Cooper, who Jerry and I worked with a lot in the consumer movement, I think brought a certain kind of a bridge from a uh, civil liberties perspective to a bit more of a consumer perspective about, and, and, and I think got us all to think about what was actually going to make a difference uh, for, for people. How was the environment that that, that this that this law was going to create or that, that whatever congressional actions were going to create, how would those affect consumer interest? And I think that was a really important part of the discussion. And then and then two people who were um, who have passed away, Judith Krug and Bruce Ennis, also just had you know huge, huge roles uh, in this and none of us and none of this would be here. Uh, without without the two of them, um, the the one just uh, kind of personal thing I'll say, um, uh, I it, it may be my own limitations, but I have to say when we were going through this, I certainly didn't have a clue that it was anywhere even 10 percent as important as it's become, um, and I think that's a lesson for all of us to to realize that. You know, all these issues are still here. We are still shaping this environment. Um, uh, we have to, as the senator said, take it deadly seriously. Uh, we we could screw it up uh, if we're not careful. We could fail to act where we need to act uh, if we're not careful. Um, uh, but just kind of as a personal note, I hope as all of you, uh, particularly those of you who are younger than some of us, are working on whatever you're working on, you know, realize the importance of what you're doing because you're you're making every bit the same kind of contribution. We just did it earlier, uh, but it, it, it continues. Um, I was supposed to look kind of forward and out internationally, but I'm going to look back and domestically to start off just for a minute. Um, to the, 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 the figure in American history who I think was the first and in a lot of ways most important intermediary we had, Ben Franklin. Uh, ben Franklin, as you know, was um, the first postmaster of the United States. He was a newspaper publisher. He did an extraordinary uh, number of things. But he, he, along with his fellow postmasters and, 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 and um, newspaper publishers, who were often one and the same, um, uh, were really the intermediaries uh, of their day. And I think Franklin, in particular, recognized the the need to build um, uh, a national system of newspapers and, more importantly, a national communication system through the post roads uh, that he was part of funding before the Constitution was written and that he got written into the Constitution. Um, it's the only piece of infrastructure in the Constitution uh, is, is, is a constitutional uh, uh, provision uh, to give the federal government explicit authority to create post roads for all you strict constructionists. You know, that's really in there. There's no, <laughs> no getting around it. I'm not looking at you, Adam. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think, it, I think it says something about his view of what it took to build a democracy and what it took to build uh, um, an economy. Uh, he said a wonderful thing. He was a printer. Uh, 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 it's where he made most of his money. Um, and he, uh, if you can believe it, uh, you know, the, the political environment then was actually probably every bit as contentious, if not more so, then as it was now. Um, and the kind of shrill uh, pamphlets that were printed and sent back and forth were regarded by many people as unseemly and uncivilized. And there was actually a lot of pressure on printers, including Franklin, uh, to control uh, what, was, what was said through this war of pamphlets. And so Franklin uh, wrote um, a piece called Apology for Printers. I want to just read you a couple sentences of it. He said, it is unreasonable to imagine that printers approve of everything that they print. It is likewise unreasonable, what some assert, that printers ought not to print anything that they disapprove of, since an end would thereby be to put to free writing, and the world would afterwards have nothing to read but what happened to be the opinions of printers. Uh, and I think that, in a lot of ways for us, is really uh, the, the, the lesson about 
about the environment that, that, that Section 230 uh, uh, sought to create. Um, we'll talk, I'm sure, about uh, some of the current questions about the roles of intermediaries. There's a lot of focus, uh, uh, not surprisingly, on intellectual property protection issues. But I think what Franklin shows us and what you heard from Todd, and if you look at the, the writings about 230, what you see is the, the broad impact that it has across all different kinds of communications, all different kinds of commercial activity, uh, all different kinds of information exchange. So there will always be tensions, as Todd points out, on the margins uh, probably about, about some of the, the – um, the intellectual property protection issues, but the but the foundation of 230, I would suggest to you, is is, is far broader than that. I want to pick up uh, where Senator Wyden left off um, with the shipping lanes of the 21st century. I think that what we certainly all saw when when we were working on these issues in the mid 90s was uh, tremendous interest from uh, many other countries uh, in how the U.S. was approaching the Internet environment, what kind of policy models we were creating. There was a very fruitful dialogue, I think, between the U.S. and Europe. Uh, Europe brought a lot of important perspectives, particularly on issues like child protection. Um, and um, I think that but, – but, but I think, as you all know, uh, there was a real sense in which the first decade or so of the Internet environment uh, really was characterized – by Ira Magaziner's bumper sticker, Hands Off the Net. Um, now, those of you who pay attention to the law know that that was actually never true. We passed 230, of course. Then a year or so later, we passed the DMCA. So we never had Hands Off the Net. But nevertheless, I think that around the world, um, uh, much as, as Todd described in the discussions of 230, around the world there was a, 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 a commitment to the view um, that uh, that we should take – the country should take a light-touch approach, and that's what would encourage uh, the development of the Internet environment. I think all of you who, who – um, work in the international environment or even in the domestic environment, recognize that the pure hands-off approach is, is pretty hard to sustain at the moment. Um, it was one thing to say hands-off something that seemed kind of like a curiosity, like a thing that was created in garages that was kind of a frill that was uh, um, off as sort of an interesting sideshow in the communications environment to something that's now central to our communications. It's the central nervous system of so much of our, of our economic life, our political life, uh, et cetera. Um, we probably don't – not probably. We can't say hands off anymore. Um, uh, but I think what that recognition has done has, has been to bring a number of countries together to say how can we approach – uh, the engagement between law and the Internet smartly. How can we approach it so that we preserve the values that are inherent in 230, so that we preserve the kind of innovation that 230 enabled? Um, many of you know that uh, just uh, this June, uh, the organization, organization for Economic Cooperation and Development brought together 34 countries, plus uh, um, uh, some observers, uh, Egypt and South Africa, uh, to discuss Internet policymaking principles. And the result of that meeting was a communique uh, that, that set out, that, that indicated these 34 countries' commitment to, to a set of basic principles about how to approach Internet policymaking. Uh, they include uh, protection of the global free flow of information, promotion of the open distributed architecture of the Internet, uh, transparency, fair process and accountability, privacy protection, individual empowerment, uh, I think inspired very much by the, 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 the views from 230, uh, intellectual property protection, and limiting Internet uh, intermediary liability. There are some other principles as well, but those are the ones that are, that are, that are worth highlighting. So this was 34 countries agreeing to these, to these principles. Um, uh, the process at the OECD goes on for uh, another little bit, uh, but once these are finalized as what is called an OECD recommendation, they will be considered uh, to be the views of these 34 countries, and probably more importantly, uh, they will be part of uh, the entry conditions for new countries that come into the OECD. Uh, Russia is very interested in joining the OECD. Brazil, India, even China are, are, are talking about it. Um, uh, the OECD is kind of 
uh, a popular uh, seal of approval these days uh, for countries that want to show their, their, their solid investment environments, their good risks uh, from an economic perspective. They have enlightened social policies. Um, so, so the fact that, that we were able to get, with the help of many of you, uh, 34 countries committed to this view means that we have the potential to spread these views about how to ensure an open Internet globally uh, will continue to flourish. Um, I, I think that really at, at the heart, um, these, these principles uh, encompass a lot of the, the, the genius of 230. On the one hand, the view that we want to avoid regulation, particularly avoid traditional regulatory processes. Um, certainly as we in the Obama administration look at new Internet policy challenges like privacy and cybersecurity, other consumer protection issues, uh, we're, we're very aware of the need for strong legal protection for individuals who use the Internet, but also very aware that we, we need, where possible, to use uh, more nimble, flexible rulemaking processes than, than what we traditionally do in some of our traditional um, regulatory agencies. Some of you may have seen uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago the Health and Human Services um, <clears throat> uh, Agency uh, announced uh, an effort with um, uh, uh, personal health um, uh, records systems uh, and the Federal Trade Commission and privacy advocates all working together to close some very important gaps in privacy protection. Uh, uh, HIPAA, for a variety of odd reasons, doesn't cover uh, uh, personal health uh, information systems. Um, uh, HHS brought together that whole community and encouraged them to adopt a code of conduct that would extend uh, privacy protection to these new uh, health information systems, and the FTC will, will, will be able to enforce those, those commitments. We didn't have to go to Congress to change the law. We didn't have to go through a long, protracted regulatory process to get a rule change. Uh, um, uh, within a matter of months, we got commitment to a new set of rules, and I think very importantly, we also got a structure that was enforceable uh, by a terrific enforcement agency, the Federal Trade Commission. I think this is in many ways the spirit uh, of 230. Um, I think the spirit of 230 is also, as, as, as both Jerry and Todd said, about encouraging um, innovation, uh, encouraging responsible action by intermediaries in particular. Uh, you, all you have to do is look at the child protection uh, efforts over the years. Stephen's been a, a huge part of that. And, and what you see is the, the um, the triumph of, of, of an effort to encourage responsible behavior by a variety of parties in the online environment uh, and an extraordinary set of technological successes where um, when, when we started this discussion in the mid-90s, there was a lot of hand-wringing about whether you could ever um, uh, uh, construct filters that would be reliable, that would offer adequate protection. There was hand-wringing on the other side. Uh, Barry Steinhardt from the ACLU wrote a great report called Fahrenheit 451 that, the, that filters would somehow burn down uh, uh, the net. Um, well, I think you look at the environment today and what you see is an incredible variety of tools using some of the most innovative artificial intelligence technologies um, uh, that, uh, is that Barry calling? <laughs> 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 um, uh, uh, you know, you, you see because, because we made a choice to defer uh, um, uh, to the responsible behavior of a number of parties in the Internet environment, what we got was an ongoing set of innovations that are providing child protection to the level that I don't think we ever would have had uh, from the regulatory process that would have arose out of CDT. But finally, I also want to say that, that, that 230, the genius of 230 was also to recognize that there was an important role for the rule of law. The other person who I should have mentioned who made a significant 230 contribution uh, was Becca Gould, um, uh, who, who was right in there uh, working for BSA and made sure that 230 had the intellectual property exemption written into it uh, um, uh, on behalf of BSA and its members. Um, so, so with that, and then and with the subsequent passage, passage of the DMCA, what we also recognized in our Internet environment, uh, and there was a lot of contention about this at the time, but I think what we recognized was that we could have an environment where we had a rule of law that could, that could preserve the free flow of information uh, uh, nonetheless and enable intermediaries to function uh, responsibly. So I think Ben Franklin would have been really proud of, of, of all of our efforts 
on 230. I think it embodies a sense of volunteerism that, that, that Ben Franklin was about. He was the guy who created the first fire department, the first fire insurance company, public libraries, all kinds of things that are, that are critical institutions in our, in our society that are voluntary. Uh, but he also, uh, uh, you know, was a drafter of the Constitution and believed that we needed to live under the rule of law. And I think Section 230 uh, does that for us. So I'm looking forward to the chance to discuss with all of you. And, and thanks again to, to Tim and to Jerry for organizing. Appreciate it.